Chapter thirty six of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter thirty six. John returns to business. Now November was upon us, and we had kept all Hallow Mass with roasting of skewered apples like so many shuttlecocks, and after that the day of forks, as became good Protestants with merry bonfires and burned batatas, and plenty of good feeding in honour of our religion. And then, while we were at wheat sowing, another visitor arrived. This was Master Jeremy Stickles, who had been a good friend to me, as described before, in London, and had earned my mother's gratitude so far as ever he chose to have it. And he seemed inclined to have it all, for he made our farmhouse his headquarters, and kept us quite at his beck and call, going out at any time of the evening, and coming back at any time of the morning, and always expecting us to be ready, whether with horse, or man, or maiden, or fire, or provisions. We knew that he was employed somehow upon the service of the king, and had at different stations certain troopers and orderlies quite at his disposal. Also we knew that he never went out, nor even slept in his bedroom, without heavy firearms well loaded, and a sharp sword nigh his hand, and that he held a great commission under royal signet, requiring all good subjects, all officers of whatever degree, and especially justices of the peace, to aid him to the utmost with person, beast, and chattel, or to answer it at their peril. Now, Master Jeremy Stickles, of course, knowing well what women are, durst not open to any of them the nature of his instructions. But after a while, perceiving that I could be relied upon, and that it was a great discomfort not to have me with him, he took me aside in a lonely place, and told me nearly everything having bound me first by oath not to impart to any one without his own permission, until all was over. But at this present time of writing, all is over long ago, I and forgotten too, I ween, except by those who suffered. Therefore may I tell the whole without any breach of confidence. Master Stickles was going forth upon his usual night journey, when he met me coming home, and I said something half in jest about his zeal and secrecy, upon which he looked all round the yard, and led me to an open space in the clover-field adjoining. John, he said, you have some right to know the meaning of all this, being trusted as you were by the Lord Chief Justice. But he found you scarcely supple enough, neither gifted with due brains. Thank God for that same, I answered, while he tapped his head to signify his own much larger allowance. Then he made me bind myself, which in an evil hour I did, to retain his secret, and after that he went on solemnly and with much importance. There be some people fit to plot, and others to be plotted against, and others to unravel plots, which is the highest gift of all. This last hath fallen to my share, and a very thankless gift it is, although a rare and choice one. Much of peril, too, attends it, Daring courage and great coolness are as needful for the work as ready wit and spotless honour. Therefore, his majesty's advisers have chosen me for this high task, and they could not have chosen a better man. Although you have been in London, Jack, much longer than you wished it, you are wholly ignorant, of course, in matters of state and the public will. Well, said I, no doubt I am, and all the better for me. Although I heard a deal of them, for everybody was talking, and ready to come to blows, if only it could be done without danger. But one said this, and one said that, and they talked so much about Birmingham's, and Tantivies, and Whigs, and Tories, and Protestant flails, and such like, that I was only too glad to have my glass and clink my spoon for answer. Right, John, thou art right, as usual. Let the king go his own gate. He hath too many mistresses to ever be England's master. Nobody need fear him, for he is not like his father. He will have his own way, tis true, but without stopping other folk of theirs. And well he knows what women are, for he never asks them questions. Now, heard you much in London town about the Duke of Monmouth? Not so very much, I answered. Not half so much as in Devonshire, only that he was a hearty man, and a very handsome one, and now is banished by the Tories and most people wished he was coming back, instead of the Duke of York, who was trying boots in Scotland. Things are changed since you were in town. The Whigs are getting up again, through the folly of the Tories killing poor Lord Russell. 
and now this Master Sidney, if my lord condemns him, will make it worse again. There is much disaffection everywhere, and it must grow to an outbreak. The king hath many troops in London, and meaneth to bring more from Tangier, but he cannot command these country places, and the trained bands cannot help him much, even if they would. Now, do you understand me, John? In truth, not I. I see not what Tangier hath to do with Exmoor, nor the Duke of Monmouth with Jeremy Stickles. Thou great clod, put it the other way. Jeremy Stickles may have much to do about the Duke of Monmouth the Whigs having failed of exclusion, and having been punished bitterly for the blood they shed, are ripe for any violence. And the turn of the balance is now to them. Seesaw is the fashion of England always, and the Whigs will soon be the top sawyers. But, said I, still more confused, the King is the top sawyer, according to our proverb. How then can the Whigs be? Thou art a hopeless ass, John better to sow with a chestnut than to teach thee the constitution. Let it be so, let it be. I have seen a boy of five years old more apt at politics than thou. Nay, look not offended, lad. It is my fault for being over-deep to thee. I should have considered thy intellect. Nay, Master Jeremy, make no apologies. It is I that should excuse myself. But God knows I have no politics." "'Stick to that, my lad,' he answered. "'So shalt thou die easier. "'Now, in ten words, without parties, "'or trying thy poor brain too much, "'I am here to watch the gathering of a secret plot, "'not so much against the king as against the due succession. "'Now I understand at last, "'but, Master Stickles, you might have said all that an hour ago almost. "'It would have been better if I had to thee.' he replied with much compassion. Thy hat is nearly off thy head with the swelling of brain I have given thee. Blows, blows are thy business, Jack. There thou art in thine element, and haply this business will bring thee plenty even for thy great head to take. Now hearken to one who wishes thee well and plainly sees the end of it. Stick thou to the winning side, and have naught to do with the other one. That, said I, in great haste and hurry, is the very thing I want to do, if I only knew which was the winning side, for the sake of Lorna, that is to say, for the sake of my dear mothers and sisters and the farm. Ha! cried Jeremy Stickles, laughing at the redness of my face. Lorna, said thou. Now, what Lorna? Is it the name of a maiden, or a light of love? Keep to your own business, I answered very proudly. Spy as much as e'er thou wilt, and use our house for doing it, without asking leave or telling. But if I ever find thee spying into my affairs, all the king's lifeguards in London, and the dragoons thou bringest hither, shall not save thee from my hand. Or oh, one finger is enough for thee. Being carried beyond myself by his insolence about Lorna, I looked at Master Stickles so, and spake in such a voice, that all his daring courage and his spotless honour quailed within him, and he shrank as if I would strike so small a man. Then I left him, and went to work at the sacks upon the corn-floor, to take my evil spirit from me before I should see mother. For, to tell the truth, now my strength was full, and troubles were gathering round me, and people took advantage so much of my easy temper. Sometimes when I was over-tried, a sudden heat ran over me, and a glowing of all my muscles, and a tingling for a mighty throw, such as my utmost self-command, and fear of hurting any one, could but ill refrain. Afterwards, I was always very sadly ashamed of myself, knowing how poor a thing bodily strength is as compared with power of mind, and that it is a coward's part to misuse it upon weaker folk. For the present, there was a little breach between Master Stickles and me, for which I blamed myself very sorely. But though, in full memory of his kindness and faithfulness in London, I asked his pardon many times for my foolish anger with him, and offered to undergo any penalty he would lay upon me. He only said it was no matter, there was nothing to forgive. When people say that, the truth often is that they can forgive nothing. So for the present, a breach was made between Master Jeremy and myself, which to me seemed no great loss, inasmuch as it relieved me from any privity to his dealings, for which I had small liking. All I feared was lest I might, in any way, be ungrateful to him. But when he would have no more of me, what could I do to help it? 
However, in a few days' time I was of good service to him, as you shall see in its proper place. But now my own affairs were thrown into such disorder that I could think of nothing else, and had the greatest difficulty in hiding my uneasiness. For suddenly, without any warning or a word of message, all my Lorna's signals ceased, which I had been accustomed to watch for daily, and as it were to feed upon them with a glowing heart. The first time I stood on the wooded crest, and found no change from yesterday, I could hardly believe my eyes, or thought at least that it must be some great mistake on the part of my love. However, even that oppressed me with a heavy heart, which grew heavier, as I found from day to day, no token. Three times I went, and waited long at the bottom of the valley, where now the stream was brown and angry with the rains of autumn, and the weeping trees hung leafless. But though I waited at every hour of day, and far into the night, no light footstep came to meet me, no sweet voice was in the air. All was lonely, drear, and drenched with sodden desolation. It seemed as if my love was dead, and the winds were at her funeral. Once I sought far up the valley, where I had never been before, even beyond the copse where Lorna had found and lost her brave young cousin. Following up the river channel, in shelter of the evening fog, I gained a corner within stone's throw of the last outlying cot. This was a gloomy, low, square house, without any light in the windows, roughly built of wood and stone, as I saw when I drew nearer. For knowing it to be Carver's dwelling, or at least suspecting so from some words of Lorna's, I was led by curiosity, and perhaps by jealousy, to have a closer look at it. Therefore I crept up the stream, losing half my sense of fear by reason of anxiety, and in truth there was not much to fear, the sky being now too dark for even a shooter of wild fowl to make good aim, and nothing else but guns could hurt me, as in the pride of my strength I thought, and in my skill of single stick. Nevertheless I went warily, being now almost among this nest of cockatrices. The back of Carver's house abutted on the waves of the rushing stream, and seeing a loophole, vacant for muskets, I looked in, but all was quiet. So far as I could judge by listening, there was no one now inside, and my heart for a moment leaped with joy, for I had feared to find Lorna there. Then I took a careful survey of the dwelling, and its windows and its door and aspect, as if I had been a robber meaning to make privy entrance. It was well for me that I did this, as you will find hereafter. Having impressed upon my mind, a slow but perhaps retentive mind, all the bearings of the place, and all its opportunities, and even the curve of the stream along it, and the bushes near the door, I was much inclined to go farther up and understand all the village. But a bar of red light across the river, some forty yards on above me, and crossing from the opposite side like a chain, prevented me. In that second house there was a gathering of loud and merry outlaws, making as much noise as if they had the law upon their side. Some, indeed, as I approached, were laying down both right and wrong, as purely and with as high a sense as if they knew the difference. Cold and troubled as I was, I could hardly keep from laughing. Before I betook myself home that night, and eased dear mother's heart so much, and made her pale face spread with smiles, I had resolved to penetrate Glen Doone from the upper end, and learn all about my Lorna. Not but what I might have entered from my unsuspected channel, as so often I had done, but that I saw fearful need for knowing something more than that. Here was every sort of trouble gathering upon me. Here was Jeremy Stickles stealing upon every one in the dark. Here was Uncle Reuben plotting Satan only could tell what. Here was a white night-capped man coming bodily from the grave. Here was my own sister Annie committed to a highwayman and mother in distraction. Most of all, here, there, and where was my Lorna stolen, dungeoned, perhaps outraged. It was no time for shilly-shally, for the balance of this and that, or for a man with blood and muscle to pat his nose and ponder. If I left my Lorna so, if I let those black-souled villains work their pleasure on my love, if the heart that clave to mine could find no vigour in it, then let maidens cease from men, and rest their faith in tabby-cats. Rudely rolling these ideas in my heavy head and brain, I resolved to let the morrow put them into form and order, but not contradict them. And then, as my constitution willed, being like that of England, I slept, and there was no stopping me. End of chapter 36 Read by Landy in Sydney, Australia, September 2008
seven of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter thirty seven. A very desperate venture. That the enterprise now resolved upon was far more dangerous than any hitherto attempted by me needs no further proof than this. I went and made my will at Porlock, with a middling honest lawyer there, not that I had much to leave, but that none could say how far the farm and all the farming stock might depend on my disposition. It makes me smile when I remember how particular I was, and how for the life of me I was puzzled to bequeath the most part of my clothes and hats and things altogether my own to Lorna, without the shrewd old lawyer knowing who she was and where she lived. At last, indeed, I flattered myself that I had baffled old Tape's curiosity, but his wrinkled smile and his speech at parting made me again uneasy. "'A very excellent will, young sir, an admirably just and virtuous will. All your effects to your nearest of kin, filial and fraternal duty thoroughly exemplified, nothing diverted to alien channels except a small token of esteem and reverence to an elderly lady, I presume.' and which may or may not be valid, or invalid, on the ground of uncertainty, or the absence of any legal status on the part of the legatee. Ha ha, yes, yes, few young men are so free from exceptionable entanglements. Two guineas is my charge, sir, and a rare good will for the money. Very prudent of you, sir. Does you credit in every way. Well, well, we all must die, and often the young before the old." Not only did I think two guineas a great deal too much money for a quarter of an hour's employment, but I also disliked particularly the words with which he concluded. They sounded, from his grating voice, like the evil omen of a croaking raven. Nevertheless, I still abode in my fixed resolve to go, and find out, if I died for it, what was become of Lorna. And herein I lay no claim to courage, the matter being simply a choice between two evils, of which by far the greater one was, of course, to lose my darling. The journey was a great deal longer to fetch around the southern hills, and enter by the dune gate, than to cross the lower land and steal in by the water-slide. However, I durst not take a horse, for fear of the dunes who might be abroad upon their usual business, but started betimes in the evening, so as not to hurry or waste any strength upon the way. And thus I came to the robber's highway, walking circumspectly, scanning the skyline of every hill, and searching the folds of every valley for any moving figure. Although it was now well on towards dark, and the sun was down an hour or so, I could see the robber's road before me, in a trough of the winding hills where the brook ploughed down from the higher barrows, and the coving banks were roofed with firs. At present there was no one passing, neither post nor sentinel, so far as I could descry, but I thought it safer to wait a little, as twilight melted into night, and then I crept down a seam of the highland, and stood upon the dune track. As the road approached the entrance, it became more straight and strong, like a channel cut off from rock, with the water brawling darkly along the naked side of it. Not a tree or bush was left to shelter a man from bullets. All was stern and stiff and rugged, as I could not help perceiving even through the darkness, and a smell as of churchyard mould, a sense of being boxed in and cooped, made me long to be out again. And here I was, or seemed to be, particularly unlucky, for as I drew near the very entrance, lightly of foot and warily, the moon, which had often been my friend, like an enemy, broke upon me, topping the eastward ridge of rock and filling all the open spaces with the play of wavering light. I shrank back into the shadowy quarter on the right side of the road, and gloomily employed myself to watch the triple entrance on which the moonlight fell askew. All across and before the three rude and beetling archways hung a felled oak overhead, black and thick and threatening. This, as I heard before, could be let fall in a moment so as to crush a score of men and bar the approach of horses. Behind this tree the rocky mouth was spanned, as by a gallery, with brushwood and piled timber, all upon a ledge of stone, where thirty men might lurk unseen and fire at any invader. From that rampart it would be impossible to dislodge them, because the rock fell sheer below them twenty feet, or it may be more, while overhead it towered three hundred, and so jutted over that nothing could be cast upon them, even if a man could climb the height. And the access to this portcullis place, if I may so call it, being no portcullis there, was through certain rocky chambers known to the tenants only. 
but the cleverest of their devices, and the most puzzling to an enemy, was that, instead of one mouth only, there were three to choose from, with nothing to betoken which was the proper access, all being pretty much alike, and all unfenced and yawning. And the common rumour was that in times of any danger, when any force was known to be on muster in the neighbourhood, they changed their entrance every day, and diverted the other two by means of sliding doors to the chasms and dark abysses. Now I could see those three rough arches, jagged, black, and terrible, and I knew that only one of them could lead me to the valley. Neither gave the river now any further guidance, but dived underground with a sullen roar, where it met the crossbar of the mountain. Having no means at all of judging which was the right way of the three, and knowing that the other two would lead to almost certain death in the ruggedness and darkness, for how could a man among precipices and bottomless depths of water without a ray of light have any chance to save his life? I do declare that I was half inclined to go away and have done with it. However, I knew one thing for certain, to wit, that the longer I stayed debating, the more would the enterprise pall upon me, and the less my relish be. And it struck me that, in times of peace, the middle way was the likeliest, and the others diverging right and left in their farther parts might be made to slide into it not far from the entrance, at the pleasure of the warders. Also I took it for good omen that I remembered, as rarely happened, a very fine line in the Latin grammar, whose emphasis and meaning is, middle road is safest. Therefore, without more hesitation, I plunged into the middle way, holding a long ash staff before me, shodden at the end with iron. Presently I was in black darkness, groping along the wall, and feeling a deal more fear than I wished to feel especially when upon looking back i could no longer see the light which i had forsaken then i stumbled over something hard and sharp and very cold moreover so grievous to my legs that it needed my very best doctrine and humour to forbear from swearing in the manner they use in london but when i arose and felt it and knew it to be a culverin i was somewhat reassured thereby inasmuch as it was not likely that they would plant this engine except in the real and true entrance Therefore I went on again, more painfully and wearily, and presently found it to be good that I had received that knock, and borne it with such patience, for otherwise I might have blundered full upon the sentries, and been shot without more ado. As it was, I had barely time to draw back, as I turned a corner upon them, and if their lanthorn had been in its place, they could scarce have failed to descry me, unless indeed I had seen the gleam before I turned the corner. There seemed to be only two of them, of size indeed and stature, as all the dunes must be, but I need not have feared to encounter them both, had they been unarmed, as I was. It was plain, however, that each had a long and heavy carbine, not in his hands as it should have been, but standing close beside him. Therefore it behoved me now to be exceedingly careful, and even that might scarce avail without luck in proportion. So I kept well back at the corner, and laid one cheek to the rock face, and kept my outer eye round the jut in the wariest mode I could compass, watching my opportunity and this is what I saw. The two villains looked very happy, which villains have no right to be, but often are, me seemeth. They were sitting in a niche of rock, with the lanthorn in the corner, quaffing something from glass measures, and playing at pushpin, or shepherd's chess, or basset, or some trivial game of that sort. Each was smoking a long clay pipe, quite of new London shape, I could see, for the shadow was thrown out clearly, and each would laugh from time to time, as he fancied he got the better of it. One was sitting with his knees up and left hand on his thigh, and this one had his back to me and seemed to be the stouter. The other leaned more against the rock, half sitting and half a straddle, and wearing leathern overalls as if newly come from riding. I could see his face quite clearly by the light of the open lanthorn, and a handsomer or a bolder face I had seldom, if ever, set eyes upon, insomuch that it made me very unhappy to think of his being so near my Lorna. How long am I to stand crouching here, I asked of myself at last, being tired of hearing them cry, Score one, score two, no, no, by dash, Charlie, by dash, I say, it is, Phelps. And yet my only chance of slipping by them unperceived was to wait till they quarrelled more, and came to blows about it. Presently, as I made up my mind to steal along towards them, for the cavern was pretty wide just there, Charlie, or Charleworth Doon, the younger and taller man, reached forth his hand to seize the money which he swore he had won that time. Upon this the other jerked his arm, vowing that he had no right to it, whereupon Charlie flung at his face the contents of the glass he was sipping, but missed him and hit the candle, which sputtered with a flare of blue flame, from the strength perhaps of the spirit, and then went out completely. 
At this, one swore and the other laughed, and before they had settled what to do, I was past them and round the corner. And then, like a giddy fool as I was, I needs must give them a startler, the whoop of an owl done so exactly as John Fry had taught me, and echoed by the roof so fearfully, that one of them dropped the tinder-box, and the other caught up his gun and cocked it, at least as I judged by the sounds they made. And then, too late, I knew my madness, for if either of them had fired, no doubt but what all the village would have arisen and rushed upon me. However, as the luck of the matter went, it proved for my advantage, for I heard one say to the other, "'Curse it, Charlie, what was that? It scared me so I have dropped my box, my flint is gone, and everything. Will the brimstone catch from your pipe, my lad?' "'My pipe is out, Phelps, ever so long. Damn it, I am not afraid of an owl, man. Give me the lanthorn and stay here. I'm not half done with you yet, my friend.' "'Well said, my boy, well said. Go straight to Carver's, mind you. The other sleepy heads will be snoring as there is nothing up to-night. No dallying now under Captain's window. Queen will have naught to say to you, and Carver will punch your head into a new wick for your lanthorn. "'Will he, though? Two can play at that.' And so, after some rude jests and laughter and a few more oaths, I heard Charlie, or at any rate somebody, coming toward me with a loose and not too sober footfall. As he reeled a little in his gait, and I would not move from his way one inch after his talk of Lorna, but only longed to grasp him, if common sense permitted it, his braided coat came against my thumb and his leathern gaiters brushed my knee. If he had turned or noticed it, he would have been a dead man in a moment, but his drunkenness saved him. So I let him reel on unharmed, and thereupon it occurred to me that I could have no better guide, passing as he would exactly where I wished to be, that is to say, under Lorna's window. Therefore I followed him without any especial caution, and soon I had the pleasure of seeing his form against the moonlit sky. Down a steep and winding path with a handrail at the corners, such as they have at Ilfracombe, Master Charlie tripped along, and indeed there was much tripping, and he must have been an active fellow to recover as he did, and after him walked I, much hoping, for his own poor sake, that he might not turn and espy me. But Bacchus, of whom I read at school with great wonder about his meaning, and the same I may say of Venus, that great deity preserved Charlie, his pious worshipper, from regarding consequences. So he led me very kindly to the top of the meadowland, where the stream from underground broke forth, seething quietly with a little hiss of bubbles. Hence I had fair view and outline of the robber's township, spread with bushes here and there, but not heavily overshadowed. The moon, approaching now the full, brought the forms in a manner forth, clothing each with character, as the moon more than the sun does to an eye accustomed. I knew that the captain's house was first, both from what Lorna had said of it, and from my mother's description, and now again from seeing Charlie halt there for a certain time, and whistle on his fingers, and hurry on, fearing consequence. The tune that he whistled was strange to me, and lingered in my ears as having something very new and striking and fantastic in it. And I repeated it softly to myself, while I marked the position of the houses and the beauty of the village. For the stream, in lieu of any street passing between the houses, and affording perpetual change and twinkling, and reflections moreover by its sleepy murmur, soothing all the dwellers here, this and the snugness of the position, walled with rock and spread with herbage, made it look in the quiet moonlight like a little paradise. And to think of all the inmates there, sleeping with good consciences, having plied their useful trade of making others work for them, enjoying life without much labour, yet with great renown. Master Charlie went down the village, and I followed him carefully, keeping as much as possible in the shadowy places, and watching the windows of every house, lest any light should be burning. As I passed Sir Ensor's house, my heart leaped up, for I spied a window higher than the rest above the ground, and with a faint light moving. This could hardly fail to be the room wherein my darling lay, for here that impudent young fellow had gazed while he was whistling. And here my courage grew tenfold, and my spirit feared no evil. For lo, if Lorna had been surrendered to that scoundrel Carver, she would not have been at her grandfather's house, but in Carver's accursed dwelling. Warm with this idea, I hurried after Charleworth Doone, being resolved not to harm him now unless my own life required it. And while I watched from behind a tree, the door of the father's house was opened, and sure enough it was Carver's self who stood bareheaded and half undressed in the doorway. I could see his great black chest and arms by the light of the lamp he bore. "'Who wants me this time of night?' he grumbled in a deep gruff voice, 
"'Any young scamp prowling after the maid shall have sore bones for his trouble.' "'All the fair maids are for thee, aren't they, Master Carver?' Charlie answered, laughing. "'We young scamps must be well content with coarser stuff than thou wouldst have.' "'Would have, ay, and will have,' the great beast muttered angrily. "'I bide my time, but not very long. "'Only one word for thy good, Charlie. "'I will fling thee senseless into the river if ever I catch thy girl face there again.' "'Mayhap, Master Carver, it is more than thou couldst do. "'But I will not keep thee. "'Thou art not pleasant company to-night. "'All I want is a light for my lanthorn, "'and a glass of schnapps if thou hast it.' "'What is become of thy light, then? "'Good for thee I am not on duty.' "'A great owl flew between me and Phelps "'as we watched beside the culvern, "'and so scared was he at our fierce bright eyes "'that he fell and knocked the light out. "'Likely tale or likely lie, Charles.' We will have the truth to-morrow. Here, take thy light, and be gone with thee. All virtuous men are in bed now. Then so will I be, and why art thou not? Ha! Have I earned my schnapps now? If thou hast, thou hast paid a bad debt. There is too much in thee already. Be off! My patience is done with. Then he slammed the door in the young man's face, having kindled his lantern by this time, and Charlie went up to the watch-place again, muttering as he passed me. Bad look out for all of us when that surly old beast is captain. No gentle blood in him, no hospitality, not even pleasant language, nor a good new oath in his frowsy pate. I've a mind to cut the whole of it, and but for the girls I would so. My heart was in my mouth, as they say, when I stood in the shade of Lorna's window and whispered her name gently. The house was of one story only, as the others were, with pine ends standing forth the stone, and only two rough windows upon that western side of it, and perhaps both of them were Lorna's. The dunes had been their own builders, for no one should know their ins and outs, and of course their work was clumsy. As for their windows, they stole them mostly from the houses round about, but though the window was not very close, I might have whispered long enough before she would have answered me, frightened as she was, no doubt by many a rude overture and I durst not speak aloud, because I saw another watchman posted on the western cliff and commanding all the valley. And now this man, having no companion for drinking or for gambling, espied me against the wall of the house, and advanced to the brink and challenged me. "'Who are you there? Answer! One, two, three, and I fire at thee!' The nozzle of his gun was pointed full upon me, as I could see, with the moonlight striking on the barrel. He was not more than fifty yards off, and now he began to reckon. Being almost desperate about it, I began to whistle, wondering how far I should get before I lost my windpipe, and as luck would have it, my lips fell into that strange tune I had practised last, the one I had heard from Charlie. My mouth would scarcely frame the notes, being parched with terror, but to my surprise the man fell back, dropped his gun, and saluted. Oh, sweetest of all sweet melodies! That tune was Carver Doone's passport, as I heard long afterwards, which Charleworth Doon had imitated for decoy of Lorna. The sentinel took me for that vile carver, who was like enough to be prowling there for private talk with Lorna, but not very likely to shout forth his name if it might be avoided. The watchman, perceiving the danger perhaps of intruding on carver's privacy, not only retired along the cliff, but withdrew himself to good distance. Meanwhile he had done me the kindest service, for Lorna came to the window at once to see what the cause of the shout was, and drew back the curtain timidly. Then she opened the rough lattice, and then she watched the cliff and trees, and then she sighed very sadly. "'Oh, Lorna, don't you know me?' I whispered from the side, being afraid of startling her by appearing over suddenly. Quick though she always was of thought, she knew me not from my whisper, and was shutting the window hastily when I caught it back and showed myself. "'John!' she cried, yet with sense enough not to speak aloud. "'Oh, you must be mad, John!' "'As mad as a March hare,' said I, without any news of my darling. "'You knew I would come. Of course you did.' "'Well, I thought, perhaps, you know. "'Now, John, you need not eat my hand. "'Do you see they have put iron bars across?' "'To be sure. "'Do you think I should be contented, even with this lovely hand, "'but for these vile iron bars? "'I will have them out before I go. "'Now, darling, for one moment, just the other hand, for a change, you know.' So I got the other, but was not honest, for I kept them both, and felt their delicate beauty trembling as I lay them to my heart. "'Oh, John, you will make me cry directly,' she had been crying long ago, "'if you go on in that way. 
You know we can never have one another. Every one is against it. Why should I make you miserable? Try not to think of me any more. And will you try the same of me, Lorna? Oh, yes, John, if you agree to it. At least, I will try to try it. Then you won't try anything of the sort, I cried with great enthusiasm, for her tone was so nice and melancholy. The only thing we will try to try is to belong to one another, and if we do our best, Lorna, God alone can prevent us. She crossed herself, with one hand drawn free as I spoke so boldly, and something swelled in her little throat and prevented her from answering. "'Now tell me,' I said, "'what means all this? Why are you so pent up here? Why have you given me no token? Has your grandfather turned against you? Are you in any danger?' "'My poor grandfather is very ill. I fear that he will not live long. The counsellor and his son are now the masters of the valley, and I dare not venture forth for fear of anything they might do to me. When I went forth to signal for you, Carver tried to seize me, but I was too quick for him.' Little Gwenny is not allowed to leave the valley now, so that I could send no message. I have been so wretched, dear, lest you should think me false to you. The tyrants now make sure of me. You must watch this house, both night and day, if you wish to save me. There is nothing they would shrink from. If my poor grandfather... Oh, I cannot bear to think of myself, when I ought to think of him only, dying without a son to tend him, or a daughter to shed a tear but surely he has sons enough, and a deal too many, I was going to say, but stopped myself in time. Why do none of them come to him? I know not. I cannot tell. He is a very strange old man, and few have ever loved him. He was black with wrath at the counsellor this very afternoon. But I must not keep you here. You are much too brave, John, and I am much too selfish. There, what was that shadow? Nothing more than a bat, darling, come to look for his sweetheart. I will not stay long. You tremble so, and yet for that very reason, how can I leave you, Lorna? You must, you must, she answered. I shall die if they hurt you. I hear the old nurse moving. Grandfather is sure to send for me. Keep back from the window. However, it was only Gwenny Carfax, Lorna's little handmaid. My darling brought her to the window and presented her to me, almost laughing through her grief. Oh, I am so glad, John. Gwenny, I am so glad you came. I have wanted long to introduce you to my young man, as you call him. It is rather dark, but you can see him. I wish you to know him again, Gwenny. Hoy! cried Gwenny, with great amazement, standing on tiptoe to look out, and staring as if she were weighing me. Her be bigger nor any doon. Here does her have bait our Cornish champion a-rastling. Twadden fair play, no how, no, no, don't tell me. Twadden fair play, no how. "'True enough, Gwenny,' I answered her, for the play had been very unfair indeed on the side of the Bodman champion. "'It was not a fair bout, little maid. I am free to acknowledge that.' By that answer, or rather by the construction she put upon it, the heart of the Cornish girl was won, more than by gold or silver. "'I shall knew thee again, young man, no fear of that,' she answered, nodding with an air of patronage. "'Now, missus, gay on courtin, and I will gay outside and watch for ye.' though expressed not over delicately. This proposal arose, no doubt, from Gwenny's sense of delicacy, and I was very thankful to her for taking her departure. "'She is the best little thing in the world,' said Lorna, softly laughing, "'and the queerest and the truest. Nothing will bribe her against me. If she seems to be on the other side, never, never doubt her. Now, no more of your courtin', John. I love you far too well for that. Yes, yes, ever so much. If you will, take a mean advantage of me.' and as much as ever you like to imagine, and then you may double it after that. Only go, do go, good John, kind, dear, darling John, if you love me, go. How can I go without settling anything? I asked, very sensibly. How shall I know of your danger now? Hit upon something, you are so quick, anything you can think of, and then I will go, and not frighten you. I have been thinking long of something, Lorna answered rapidly, with that peculiar clearness of voice which makes every syllable ring like music of a several note. You see that tree with the seven rook's nest bright against the cliffs there? Can you count them from above, do you think? From a place where you will be safe, dear? No doubt I can, or if I cannot, it will not take me long to find a spot whence I can do it. Gwenny can climb like any cat. She has been up there in the summer, watching the young birds day by day and daring the boys to touch them. There are neither birds nor eggs there now, of course, and nothing doing. If you see but six rooks' nests, I am in peril and want you. If you see but five, I am carried off by Carver. "'Good God!' said I, at the mere idea, in a tone which frightened Lorna. 
"'Fear not, John,' she whispered sadly, and my blood grew cold at it. "'I have means to stop him, or at least to save myself. "'If you can come within one day of that man's getting hold of me, "'you will find me quite unharmed. "'After that you will find me dead, or alive, according to circumstances, "'but in no case such that you need blush to look at me.' "'Her dear sweet face was full of pride, as even in the gloom I saw, "'and I would not trespass on her feelings by such a thing at such a moment, as an attempt at any caress. I only said, God bless you, darling, and she said the same to me in a very low, sad voice. And then I stole below Carver's house in the shadow from the eastern cliff, and knowing enough of the village now to satisfy all necessity, betook myself to my well-known track in returning from the valley, which is neither down the water-slide, a course I feared in the darkness, nor up the cliffs at Lorna's bower, but a way of my own inventing, which there is no need to dwell upon. A weight of care was off my mind, though much of trouble hung there still. One thing was quite certain. If Lorna could not have John Ridd, no one else should have her. And my mother, who sat up for me and with me a long time afterwards, agreed that this was comfort. End of chapter 37 Read by Landy in Sydney, Australia, September 2008《of Lorna Doone》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Lorna Doone》by R. D. Blackmore Chapter 38 A Good Turn for Jeremy John Fryer had now six shillings a week of regular and permanent wage, besides all harvest and shearing money, as well as a cottage rent-free, and enough of garden ground to rear pot-herbs for his wife and all his family. Now the wages appointed by our justices at the time of sessions were four and sixpence a week for summer, and a shilling less for the winter time, and we could be fined, and perhaps imprisoned, for giving more than the sum so fixed. Therefore John Fry was looked upon as the richest man upon Exmoor, I mean, of course, among labourers, and there were many jokes about robbing him, as if he were the mint of the king, and Tom Faggus promised to try his hand if he came across John on the highway, although he had ceased from business and was seeking a royal pardon. Now is it according to human nature, or is it a thing contradictory, as I would fain believe? But anyhow, there was upon Exmoor no more discontented man, no man more sure that he had not his worth, neither half so sore about it, then, as or John Fry was. And one thing he did, which I could not wholly, or indeed I may say in any measure, reconcile with my sense of right, much as I laboured to do John justice, especially because of his roguery, and this was, that if we said too much, or accused him at all of laziness, which he must have known to be in him, he regularly turned round upon us, and quite compelled us to hold our tongues, by threatening to lay information against us for paying him too much wages. Now I have not mentioned all this of John Fry from any disrespect for his memory, which is green and honest among us, far less from any desire to hurt the feelings of his grandchildren, and I will do them the justice once for all, to avow thus publicly that I have known a great many bigger rogues, and most of themselves in the number, but I have referred with moderation to this little flaw in a worthy character, or foible as we call it when a man is dead, for this reason only, that without it there was no explaining John's dealings with Jeremy Stickles. Master Jeremy, being full of London and Norwich experience, fell into the error of supposing that we clods and yokels were the simplest of the simple, and could be cheated at his good pleasure. Now this is not so. When once we suspect that people have that idea of us, we indulge them in it to the top of their bent, and greed that they should come out of it, as they do at last in amazement, with less money than before, and the laugh now set against them. Ever since I had offended Jeremy, by threatening him, as before related, in the case of his meddling with my affairs, he had more and more allied himself with simple-minded John, as he was pleased to call him. John Fryer was everything. It was, run and fetch my horse, John. John, are my pistols primed well? I want you in the stable, John, about something very particular. Until, except for the rudeness of it, I was longing to tell Master Sickles that he ought to pay John's wages. John, for his part, was not backward, but gave himself the most wonderful airs of secrecy and importance, till half the parish began to think that the affairs of the nation were in his hand, and he scorned the sight of a dung-fork. 
It was not likely that this should last, and being the only man in the parish with any knowledge of politics, I gave John Fry to understand that he must not presume to talk so freely, as if he were at least a constable, about the Constitution, which could be no affair of his, and might bring us all into trouble. At this he only tossed his nose, as if he had been in London at least three times for my one, which vexed me so that I promised him the thick end of the plough-whip, if even the name of a knight of the shire should pass his lips for a fortnight. Now I did not suspect in my stupid noddle that John Fry would ever tell Jeremy Stickles about the sight at the wizard's slough, and the man in the white nightcap, because John had sworn on the blade of his knife not to breathe a word to any soul without my full permission. However, it appears that John related, for a certain consideration, all that he had seen, and doubtless more which had accrued to it. Upon this, Master Stickles was much astonished at Uncle Reuben's proceedings, having always accounted him a most loyal, keen, and wary subject. All this I learned upon recovering Jeremy's good graces, which came to pass in no other way than by the saving of his life. Being bound to keep the strictest watch upon the seven rooks' nests, and yet not bearing to be idle and to waste my mother's stores, I contrived to keep my work entirely at the western corner of our farm, which was nearest to Glen Doon, and whence I could easily run to a height commanding the view I coveted. One day Squire Faggus had dropped in upon us, just in time for dinner, and very soon he and King's messenger were as thick as need be. Tom had brought his beloved mare to show her off to Annie, and he mounted his pretty sweetheart upon her, after giving Winnie notice to be on her very best behaviour. The squire was in great spirits, having just accomplished the purchase of land which was worth ten times what he gave for it, and this he did by a merry trick upon old Sir Roger Bassett, who never supposed him to be in earnest as not possessing the money. The whole thing was done on a bumper of claret in a tavern where they met, and the old knight, having once pledged his word, no lawyers could hold him back from it. They could only say that Master Faggus, being attainted of felony, was not a capable grantee. "'I will soon cure that,' quoth Tom. "'My pardon has been ready for months and months, so soon as I care to sue it.' And now he was telling our Annie, who listened very rosily and believed every word he said, that, having been ruined in early innocence by the means of lawyers, it was only just, and fair turn for turn, that having become a match for them by long practice upon the highway, he should reinstate himself at their expense in society. And now he would go to London at once, and sue out his pardon, and then would his lovely darling Annie, etc., etc., things which I had no right to hear, and in which I was not wanted. Therefore I strode away up the lane to my afternoon's employment, sadly comparing my love with theirs, which now appeared so prosperous, yet heartily glad for Annie's sake, only remembering now and then the old proverb, wrong never comes right. I worked very hard in the copse of young ash, with my bill-hook and a shearing knife, cutting out the saplings where they stalled too close together, making spars to keep for thatching, wall crooks to drive into the cob, styles for close sheep hurdles, and handles for rakes and hoes and two bills of the larger and straighter stuff. And all the lesser I bound into faggots to come home on the sled to the woodrick. It is not to be supposed that I did all this work without many peeps at the seven rooks' nests, which proved my Lorna's safety. Indeed, whenever I wanted to change either from cleaving or hewing too hard, or stooping too much at binding, I was up and away to the ridge of the hill, instead of standing and doing nothing. Soon I forgot about Tom and Annie, and fell to thinking of Lorna only, and how much I would make of her, and what I should call our children, and how I would educate them, to do honour to her rank yet all the time I worked none the worse by reason of meditation. Fresh-cut spars are not so good as those of a little seasoning, especially if the sap was not gone down at the time of cutting. Therefore we always find it needful to have plenty still in stock. It was very pleasant there in the copse, sloping to the west as it was, and the sun descending brightly, with rocks and banks to dwell upon. The stems of mottled and dimpled wood, with twigs coming out like elbows, hung and clung together closely, with a mode of bending in as children do at some danger. Overhead the shrunken leaves quibbled and rustled ripely, having many points like stars, and rising and falling delicately as fingers play sad music. Along the bed of the slanting ground, or between the stools of wood, there were heaps of dead brown leaves, and sheltered mats of lichen, and drifts of spotted stick gone rotten, and tufts of rushes here and there, full of fray and feathering. All by the hedge ran a little stream, a thing that could barely name itself, flowing scarce more than a pint in a minute, because of the sunny weather. Yet had this reel little crooks and crannies, dark and bravely bearded, and a gallant rush through a reed and pipe, the stem of a flag that was grounded, 
and here and there divided threads from the point of a branching stick into mighty pool of rock, as large as a grown man's hat almost, napped with moss all around the sides and hung with corded grasses. Along and down the tiny banks, and nodding into one another, even across main channel, hung the brown arcade of ferns, some with gold tongues languishing, some with countless eardrops jerking, some with great quilled ribs uprising and long sores a-flapping, others cupped and fanning over with the grace of yielding, even as a hollow fountain spread by winds that have lost their way. Deeply each beyond other, pluming, stooping, glancing, glistening, weaving softest pillow lace, coying to the wind and water, where their fleeting image danced, or by which their beauty moved, God has made no lovelier thing, and only he takes heed of them. It was time to go home to supper now, and I felt very friendly towards it, having been hard at work for some hours, with only the voice of the little rill, and some hares and a pheasant for company. The sun was gone down behind the black wood on the further cliffs of Bagworthy, and the russet of the tufts and spear-beds was becoming grey, while the greyness of the sapling ash grew brown against the sky. The hollow curves of the little stream became black beneath the grasses, and the fairy fans innumerable, while outside the hedge our clover was crimping its leaves in the dewfall, like the cocked hats of wood-sorrel, when, thanking God for all this scene, because my love had gifted me with the key to all things lovely, I prepared to follow their example, and to rest from labour. Therefore I wiped my billhook and shearing knife very carefully, for I hate to leave tools dirty, and was doubting whether I should try for another glance at the seven rooks' nests, or whether it would be too dark for it. It was now a quarter of an hour, mayhap, since I had made any chopping noise, because I had been assorting my spars and tying them in bundles, instead of plying the billhook, and the gentle tinkle of the stream was louder than my doings. To this, no doubt, I owe my life, which then, without my dreaming it, was in no little jeopardy. For, just as I was twisting the bind of my very last faggot, before tucking the cleft tongue under, there came three men outside the hedge, where the western light was yellow, and by it I could see that all three of them carried firearms. These men were not walking carelessly, but following down the hedge trough, as if to stalk some enemy, and for a moment it struck me cold to think it was I they were looking for. With the swiftness of terror I concluded that my visits to Glen Doone were known, and now my life was the forfeit. It was a most lucky thing for me that I heard their clothes catch in the brambles, and saw their hats under the rampart of ash, which is made by what we call splashing, and lucky for me that I stood in a goyal and had the dark coppice behind me. To this I had no time to fly, but with a sort of instinct threw myself flat in among the thick fern, and held my breath, and lay still as a log. For I had seen the light gleam on their gun-barrels, and knowing the faults of the neighbourhood would fain avoid swelling their number. Then the three men came to the gap in the hedge where I had been in and out so often, and stood up and looked in over. It is all very well for a man to boast that in all his life he has never been frightened, and believes that he never could be so. There may be men of that nature, I will not dare to deny it, only I have never known them. The fright I was now in was horrible, and all my bones seemed to creep inside me, when lying there helpless, with only a billet and the comb of fern to hide me in the dusk of early evening, I saw three faces in the gap, and what was worse, three gun muzzles. "'Somebody been at work here,' it was the deep voice of Carver Doon. "'Jump up, Charlie, and look about. We must have no witnesses.' "'Give me a hand behind,' said Charlie, the same handsome young Doon I had seen that night. "'This bank is too devilish steep for me.' "'Nonsense, man!' cried Marwa de Wickerhauser, who, to my amazement, was the third of the number. "'Only a hind-cutting faggots, and of course he hath gone home long ago. Blind man's holiday, as we call it. I can see all over the place, and there is not even a rabbit there.' At that I drew my breath again, and thanked God I had gotten my coat on. "'Squire is right,' said Charlie, who was standing up high, on a root, perhaps. "'There is nobody there now, Captain, and lucky for the poor devil that he keepeth workman's hours. Even his chopper is gone, I see. "'No dog, no man, is the rule about here when it comes to coppice work,' continued young de Vickerhauser. "'There is not a man would dare work there without a dog to scare the pixies.' "'There is a big young fellow upon this farm,' Carver Doon muttered sulkily, "'with whom I have an account to settle if ever I come across him.' He hath a cursed spite to us, because we shot his father. He was going to bring the lumpers upon us, only he was afeard last winter. And he hath been in London lately for some traitorous job, I doubt. 
"'Oh, you mean that fool, John Ridd,' answered the young squire. "'A very simple clodhopper. "'No treachery in him, I warrant. "'He hath not the head for it. "'All he cares about is wrestling. "'As strong as a bull, and with no more brains.' "'A bullet for that bull,' said Carver, "'and I could see the grin on his scornful face. "'A bullet for ballast to his brain, "'the first time I came across him. "'Nonsense, Captain. "'I won't have him shot, for he is my old schoolfellow, "'and hath a very pretty sister. "'But his cousin is of a different mould "'and ten times as dangerous. "'We shall see, lads, we shall see,' "'grumbled the great black-bearded man. "'Ill bodes for the fool that would hinder me. "'But come, let us onward.' "'No lingering, or the viper will be in the bush from us. "'Body and soul, if he give us the slip, both of you shall answer it.' "'No fear, Captain, and no hurry,' Charlie answered gallantly. "'What I were as sure of living a twelve months as he is of dying within the hour. "'Extreme unction for him in my bullet-patch. "'Remember, I claim to be his confessor, because he hath insulted me.' "'Thou art welcome to the job for me,' said Marwood, as they turned away and kept along the hedgerow. I love to meet a man sword to sword, not to pop at him from a foxhole. What answer was made I could not hear, for by this time the stout ashen hedge was between us, and no other gap to be found in it, until at the very bottom where the corner of the copse was. Yet was I not quit of danger now, for they might come through that second gap, and then would be sure to see me unless I crept into the uncut thicket before they could enter the clearing. But in spite of all my fear, I was not wise enough to do that and in truth the words of Carver Doone had filled me with such anger, knowing what I did about him, and his pretence to Lorna, and the sight of Squire Marwood in such outrageous company, had so moved my curiosity, and their threats against some unknown person so aroused my pity, that much of my prudence was forgotten, or at least the better part of courage, which loves danger at long distance. Therefore, holding fast my bill-hook, I dropped myself very quietly into the bed of the runnel, being resolved to take my chance of their entrance at the corner, where the water dived through the hedgerow. And so I followed them down the fence, as gently as a rabbit goes. Only I was inside it, and they on the outside, but yet so near that I heard the branches rustle as they pushed them. Perhaps I had never loved fern so much as when I came to the end of that little gully, and stooped betwixt two patches of them, now my chiefest shelter, for cattle had been through the gap just there, in quest of fodder and coolness, and had left but a mound of trodden earth between me and the outlaws. I mean, at least in my left hand, upon which side they were, for in front, where the brook went out of the copse, was a good stiff hedge of holly. And now I prayed heaven to lead them straight on, for if they once turned to their right through the gap, the muzzles of their guns would come almost against my forehead. I heard them, for I durst not look, and could scarce keep still for trembling. I heard them trampling outside the gap, uncertain which track they should follow. And in that fearful moment, with my soul almost looking out of my body, expecting notice to quit it, what do you think I did? I counted the threads in a spider's web, and the flies he had lately eaten as their skeletons shook in the twilight. "'We shall see him better in there,' said Carver, in his horrible gruff voice, like the creaking of the gallows chain. "'Sit there, behind Holly Hedge, lad, while he cometh down yonder hill. "'And then our good evening to him, one at his body and two at his head, "'and good aim, lest we balk the devil.' "'I tell you, Captain, that will not do,' said Charlie, almost whispering. "'You are very proud of your skill, we know, and can hit a lark if you see it. "'But he may not come until after dark, and we cannot be too nigh to him. "'This Holly Hedge is too far away. "'He crosses down here from Slocum's Lade, not from Tubercot, I tell you.' but along that track to the left there, and so by the foreland to Glenthorne, where his boat is in the cove. Do you think I have tracked him so many evenings without knowing his line to a hare? Will you fall away all my trouble? Come then, lad, we will follow thy lead. Thy life for his, if we fail of it. After me, then, right into the hollow. Thy legs are growing stiff, Captain. So shall thy body be, young man, if thou leadest me astray in this. I heard them stumbling down the hill, which was steep and rocky in that part, and peering through the hedge I saw them enter a covert by the side of the track which Master Stickles followed almost every evening when he left our house upon business. And then I knew who it was they were come on purpose to murder, a thing which I might have guessed long before but for terror and cold stupidity. Oh, that God, I thought for a moment, waiting for my blood to flow, oh, that God had given me brains to meet such cruel dastards according to their villainy, the power to lie and the love of it, the stealth to spy and the glory in it, 
above all the quiet relish for blood and joy in death of an enemy these are what any man must have to contend with the dunes upon even terms and yet i thank god that i have not any of these it was no time to dwell upon that only to try if might be to prevent the crime they were bound upon to follow the armed men down the hill would have been certain death to me because there was no covert there and the last light hung upon it it seemed to me that my only chance to stop the mischief pending was to compass the round of the hill as fast as feet could be laid to ground only keeping out of sight from the valley and then down the rocks and across the brook to the track from slocum slade so as to stop the king's messenger from travelling any further if only i could catch him there and this was exactly what i did and a terrible run i had for it fearing at every step to hear the echo of shots in the valley and dropping down the scrubby rocks with tearing and violent scratching then i crossed bagworthy stream not far below dune valley and breasted the hill towards slocum slade with my heart very heavily panting why jeremy chose to ride this way instead of the more direct one which would have been over or our hill was more than i could account for but i had nothing to do with that all i wanted was to save his life and this i did by about a minute and which was the hardest thing of all with a great horse pistol at my head as i seized upon his bridle jeremy jerry was all i could say being so fearfully short of breath for i had crossed the ground quicker than any horse could spoken just in time john ridd cried master stickles still however pointing the pistol at me i might have known thee by thy size john what art doing here come to save your life for god's sake go no further three men in the covert there with long guns waiting for thee ha i have been watched of late that is why i pointed at thee john back round this corner and get thy breath and tell me all about it i never saw a man so hurried i could beat thee now john jeremy stickles was a man of courage and presence of mind and much resource otherwise he would not have been appointed for this business nevertheless he trembled greatly when he heard what i had to tell him but i took good care to keep back the name of young marwa de rickerhauser neither did i show my knowledge of the other men for reasons of my own not very hard to conjecture we will let them cool their heels john ridd said jeremy after thinking a little i cannot fetch my musketeers either from glenthorne or lynmouth in time to seize the fellows and three desperate doones well armed are too many for you and me one result this attempt will have and it will make us attack them sooner than we had intended and one more it will have good john it will make me thy friend for ever shake hands my lad and forgive me freely for having been so cold to thee mayhap in the troubles coming it will help thee not a little to have done me this good turn upon that he shook me by the hand with a pressure such as we feel not often and having learned from me how to pass quite beyond view of his enemies he rode on to his duty whatever it might be for my part i was inclined to stay and watch how long the three fusiliers would have the patience to lie in wait but seeing less and less use in that as i grew more and more hungry i swung my coat about me and went home to plubber's barrows End of chapter thirty eight read by landy in sydney australia october two thousand and eight of Lorna Doom. This is a Liberox recording. All Liberox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Liberox.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Lorna Doom by Aura D. Blackmore. Chapter 39. A Troubled State and a Foolish Joke stickles took me aside the next day and opened all his business to me whether i would or not but i gave him clearly to understand that he was not to be vexed with me neither to regard me as in any way dishonest if i should use for my own purpose or for the benefit of my friends any part of the knowledge and privy thus enforced upon me to this he agreed quite readily, but upon the express provision that I should do nothing to thwart his schemes, neither unfold them to any one, 
but otherwise be allowed to act according to my own conscience, and as consistent with the honor of a loyal gentleman, for so he was pleased to term me. Now what he said lay in no great compass, and may be summed in smaller still, especially as people know the chief part of it already. Disaffection to the king, or rather dislike to his brother James, and fear of Roman ascendancy, had existed now for several years, and of late was spreading rapidly. Partly through the downright arrogance of the Troy fraction, the cruelty and austerity of the Duke of York, the corruption of justice, and confiscation of ancient rights and charters, partly through jealousy of the French king and his potent voice in our affairs, and partly, or perhaps one might even say mainly, through that natural tide in all political channels, which verily moves as if it had the moon itself for its mistress. No sooner is a thing done and fixed, being set far in advance perhaps of all that was done before, like a new mole in the sea, but immediately the waters retire, lest they should undo it, and every one says how fine it is, but leaves other people to walk on it. Then after a while, the vague endless ocean, having retired and lain still without a breeze or a murmur, frets and heaves again with the impulse, or with lashes laid on it, and in one great surge advances over every rampart. And so there was, at the time I speak of, a great surge in England, not rolling yet, but seething, and one which a thousand chief justices in a million Jeremy Stickles should never be able to stop or turn by stringing up men in front of it, any more than a rope of onions can repulse a volcano. But the worst of it was that this great movement took a wrong channel at first, not only missing legitimate line, but roaring out that the back ditch way was the true and established course of it. Against this rash and random current, nearly all the ancient mariners of the state were set, not to allow the brave ship to drift there, though some little boats might try it. For the present there seemed to be a pulse, with no open onset, but people on the shore expecting, each according to his wishes, and the feel of his own finger, whence the rush of wind should come which might direct the waters. Now, to reduce high figures of speech into our own little numerals, all the towns of Somersetshire and the half-towns of Devonshire were full of pushing, eager people ready to swallow anything, or to make others swallow it, whether they believe the folly about the black box, and all that stuff, is not for me to say, only one thing I know, they pretended to do so, and persuaded the ignorant Rustins, Taunton, Bridgewater, Minehead, and Doverton, took the lead of the other towns in utterance of their discontent and threats of what they meant to do if ever a papist declared to climb the protestant throne of england on the other hand the troy leaders were not as yet under apprehension of an immediate outbreak and feared to damage their own cause by premature coercion for the struggle was not very likely to begin in earnest during the life of the present king, unless he should, as some people hoped, be so far emboldened as to make public profession of the faith which he held, if any. So the Troy policy 
was to watch, not indeed permitting their opponents to gather strength, and muster in armed force or with other order, but being well apprised of all their schemes and attendant movements, to wait for some bold overact, and then to strike severely, and as a toy watchman or spy, as the Whigs would call him, Jeremy Stickles was now among us, and his duty was threefold. First, and most obstinately, to see to the levian of poundage in the little haven of Linemouth, and farther up the coast, which was now becoming a place of resort for the folk whom we call smugglers, that is to say, who land their goods without regard to king's revenue as by law established. And indeed, there had been no officer appointed to take toll until one had been sent to Minehead, not so very long before. The exercise as well, which had been ordered in the time of the long parliament, had been little heeded by the people hereabouts. Secondly, his duty was, though only the Dunes had discovered it, to watch those outlaws narrowly and report their manners, which were scanty doings, which were too manifold, reputation, which was execrable and politics, whether true to the king and the pope, or otherwise. Jeremy Stickles' third business was entirely political to learn the temper of our people and the gentle families to watch the movements of the trained bands, which could not always be trusted, to discover any collecting of arms and drilling of men among us, to prevent, if need were by open force, any importation of gunpowder of which there had been some rumor, in a word, to observe and forestall the enemy. Now in providing for this last mentioned service, the government had made a great mistake, doubtless through their anxiety to escape any public attention for all the disposable force at their emissary's command amounted to no more than a score of musketeers, and these so divided among the coast as scarcely to suffice for the duty of sentinels. He held a commission, it is true, for the employment of the trained bands, but upon the understanding that he was not to call upon them except as a last resort for any political object, although he might use them against the dunes as private criminals, if found needful, and supposing that he could get them. So you see, John, he said in conclusion, I have more work than tools to do with it. I am heartily sorry I ever accepted such a mixed and meager commission. At the bottom of it lies, I am well convinced, not only the desire to keep things quiet, but the paltry jealousy of the military people. Because I am not a colonel, forsooth, or a captain in His Majesty's service, it would never do to trust me with a company of soldiers, and yet they would not send either colonel or captain for fear of a stir in the rustic mind. The only thing that I can do with any chance of success is to rout out these vile doomed fellows and burn their houses over their heads. Now what think you of that, John Reed? Destroy the town of the dunes, I said, and all the dunes inside it? Surely, Jeremy, you would never think of such a cruel act as that. A cruel act, John? It would be a mercy for at least three counties. No doubt you folk who live so near are well accustomed to them and would miss your liveliness in coming home after nightfall and the joy of finding your sheep and cattle right 
when you not expected it. But after a while you might get used to the dullness of being safe in your beds and not losing your sisters and sweethearts. Surely, on the whole, it is as pleasant not to be robbed as to be robbed. I think we should miss them very much, I answered after consideration, for the possibility of having no dunes had never yet occurred to me, and we all were so thoroughly used to them, and allowed for it in one year's reckoning. I am sure we would miss them very sadly, and something worse would come of it. <laughs> Thou art the staunchiest of all staunch Tories, cried Stickles, laughing as he shook my hand. Thou believest in the divine right of robbers, who are good enough to steal thy own fat sheep. I am a jolly toy, John, but thou art ten times jollier. Oh, the grief in thy face at the thought of being robbed no longer. He laughed in a very unseemly manner, while I described nothing to laugh about. For we always like to see our way, and a sudden change upsets us. And unless it were in the loss of the farm, or the death of the king, or of Betty Muxworthy, there was nothing that could so unsettle our minds as the loss of the dunes of Bagworthy. And beside all this, I was thinking, of course, and thinking more than all the rest, about the troubles that might ensue to my own beloved Lorna. If an attack of Glendoon were made by savage soldiers and rude train bands, what might happen, or what might not, to my delicate, innocent darling? Therefore, when Jeremy Stickles again placed the matter before me, commending my strength and courage and skill to flatter me of the highest, and finished by saying that I would be worth at least four common men to him, I cut him short as follows. Master Stickles, once for all, I will have naught to do with it. The reason why is no odds of thine, nor in any way disloyal. Only in thy plans remember that I will not strike a blow, neither give any counsel, neither guard any prisoners not strike a blow cried jeremy against thy father's murderers john not a single blow jeremy unless i knew the man who did it and he glorified in his sin it was a foul and dastardly deed yet not done in cold blood neither in cold blood will i take god's task of avenging it very well john answered master stickles i know thine obstinately when thy mind is made up to argue with thee is pelting a rock with peppercorns but thou hast some other reason lad unless i am much mistaken over and above thy merciful nature and christian forgiveness anyhow come and see it john there will be good sport i reckon especially when we thrust our claws into the nest of the ravens many a yeoman will find his daughter and some of the pork lock lads their sweethearts a nice young maiden now for thee john if indeed any no more of this i answered very sternly it is no business of thine jeremy and i will have no joking upon this matter good my lord so be it but one thing I thee tell thee in earnest, we will have thy old double dealing uncle, Huckaback of Doverton, and march him first to assault Doon Castle, surely as my name is Stickles. I hear that he hath often vowed to storm the valley himself, if only he could find a dozen musketeers to back him. Now we will give him chance to do it and prove his loyalty to the king 
which lies under some suspicion of late. With regard to this, I had nothing to say, for it seemed to me very reasonable that Arkham Reuben should have first chance of recovering his stolen goods, about which he had made such a sad to-do and promised himself such vengeance. I made bold, however, to ask Master Stickles at what time he intended to carry out this great and hazardous attempt. He answered that he had several things requiring first to be set in order, and that he must make an inland journey, even as far as Tiverton and perhaps Credenton and Exeter, to collect his forces and ammunition for them. For he meant to have some of the yeomanry as well as of the train bands, so that if the dunes should sally forth, as perhaps they would, on horseback, cavalry might be there to meet them and cut them off from returning. All this made me very uncomfortable, for many and many reasons, the chief and foremost being, of course, my anxiety about Lorna. If the attack succeeded, what was to become of her? Who would rescue her from the brutal soldiers? Even supposing that she escaped from the hands of her own people, during the danger and the ferocity. And in smaller ways, I was much put out, for instance. Who would ensure our corn ricks, sheep and cattle, ay, and even our fat pigs, now coming on for bacon, against the spreading all over the country of unlicensed marauders. The dunes had their rights, and understood them, and took them according to prescription, even as the parson had, and the lords of manners, and the king himself, God save him. But how were these low soldiering fellows, half starved at home very likely, and only too glad of the fat of the land, and ready, according to our proverb, to burn the paper they fried in, who were they to come heckering and harrowing over us, and hilo got basiling with our pretty sisters to cook for them, and be chuckled under a chin perhaps afterwards. There is nothing England hates so much, according to my senses of it, as that fellow's taken from prog tail, cart tail, pot houses, and parish stocks, should be hoisted and foisted upon us, after a few months drilling, and their line shaped into truckling, as defenders of the public wheel, and heroes of the universe. In another way I was vexed, moreover, for after all we must consider the opinions of our neighbors, namely, that I knew quite well how everybody for ten miles around, for my fame must have been at least that wide after all my wrestling, would lift up hands and cry out this, Black shame on John Reed if he lets them go without him. Putting all these things together, as well as many others, which our own wits will suggest to you, it is impossible, but you will freely acknowledge that this unfortunate John Reed was now in a coven stick. There was Lorna, my love and life, bound by her duty to that old Villeney, I mean to her good grandfather, who could now do little mischief and therefore deserved all praise, Lorna bound, at any rate, by her womanly feelings, if not by sense of duty, to remain in the thick danger, with nobody to protect her, but everybody to covet her, for beauty and position. Here was all the country roused with violent excitement, at the chance of snapping at the dunes, and not only getting tit for tat, but every young man promising his sweetheart a gold chain, and his mother at least a shilling. And here was our own mow-yard, better filled 
than we could remember, and perhaps every sheaf in it destined to be burned or stolen, before we had finished the bread we had baked. Among all these troubles there was, however, or seemed to be, one comfort. Tom Fagus returned from London very proudly and very happily, with a royal pardon in black and white, which everybody admired the more, because no one could read a word of it. The squire himself acknowledged cheerfully that he could sooner take fifty purses than read a single line of it. Some people indeed went so far as to say that the parchment was made from a sheep Tom had stolen, and that was why it prevacated so in giving him a character. But I, knowing something by this time of lawyers, was able to contradict them, affirming that the wolf had more than the sheep to do with this matter. For, according to our old saying, the three learned professions live by roguery on the three parts of a man. The doctor mauls our bodies, the parson starves our soul, but the lawyer must be the adroitest knave, for he has to ensnare our minds. Therefore he takes a careful delight in covering his traps and engines with a spread of dead leaf words, whereof himself knows little more than half the way to spell them. But now Tom Fagus, although having wit to gallop away on his strawberry mare with the speed of terror from lawyers, having paid them with money too honest to stop, yet fell into a reckless adventure, ere ever he came home, from which any lawyer would have saved him, although he ought to have needed none beyond common thought for dear Annie. Now I am, and ever have been, so vexed about this story that I cannot tell it pleasantly, as I try to write in general, in my own words and manner. Therefore, I will let John Fry, whom I have robbed of another story, to which he was more entitled, and whom I have robbed of many speeches, which he thought very excellent, lest I should grieve any one with his lack of education, the last lack he ever felt, by the by. Now, with your good leave, I will allow poor John to tell his tale, in his own words and style, which he has a perfect right to do, having been the first to tell us. For Squire Fagus kept it close, not trusting even Annie with it, or at least she said so, because no man knows much of his sweetheart's tongue until she has borne him a child or two. Only before John begins his story, this I would say, in duty to him, and in common honesty, that I dare not write down some few of his words, because they are not convenient, for dialect or other causes, and that I cannot find any way of spelling many of the words which I do repeat. So that people, not born in Exmoor, may know how he pronounced them, even if they could bring their lips and their legs to the proper attitude. And in this I speak advisedly, having observed some thousand times that the manner of a man has of spreading his legs and bending his knees, or stiffening, and even the way he will set his heel, make all the difference in his tone, and time of casting his voice aright, and power of coming home to you. We always like John's stories, not for any wit in them, but because we laughed at the man rather than the matter. The way he held his head was enough, with his chin fixed hard like a certainty, especially during his biggest lie. Not a sign of a smile in his lips or nose, but a power of not laughing and his eyes not turning to anybody, unless somebody had too much of it, 
as young girls always do, and went over the brink of laughter. Thereupon it was good to see John Fry, how he looked gravely first at the laughter, as much as to ask, What is it now? Then, if the fool went laughing more, as he or she was sure to do upon that dry inquiry, John would look again, to be sure of it, and then as somebody else to learn whether the laugh had company. Then if he got another grin, all his mirth came out in glory, with a sudden break, and he wiped his lips and was grave again. Now John, being too much encouraged by the girls, of which I could never break them, came into the house that December evening with every inch of him full of a tail. Annie saw it, and Lizzie, of course, and even I, in the gloom of great evils, perceived that John was a loaded gun, but I did not care to explode him. Now nothing primed him so hotly as this. If you wanted to hear all John Fry had heard, the surest of all sure ways to it was to pretend not to care for a word of it. I want all the X for in the morning, John began from the chimney corner looking straight at Annie, for to see a little calf, Jan, as us couldn't get thee to laze her out of house. Missy have got a square fancy for him, for what her have heard of the brave. Now zit quiet, will you, Miss Zizzy, or a won't goin' on the further. Vain little tale, I tell you. So be zee zit quiet. Woo, as I come down to here, I see the straight of Volks a strappin' of the Roudi. All on em with grit goons, or two men out of three with em. Reckon there were three score of em. Talk small and beg together like it. Loud around woman and chillers. Some of them were matches blowing, totators with flint lacks. We'll be up now, I says to be a blacksmith, as had knowledge of me. Be the king of coming? If her be, do ye want to shun em? Thee not now, says Bill Blacksmith. Just the same as I be a tellin' of it. What a man us suspect Tom Fagus and Zuma's us mains to shut em? Shut em without a warrant, says I. Sure he knows better no thick, Bill. A man maiden shut to another man without have a warrant? Bill, was it so z? Last time I seen him, and nothing to the contrary. Ha ha ha, never fight about that, said Bill. Same as I be telling you. Us has warns and worshipping now, do you for on em? And more, nor a dozen warranties, for you I know the contrary. Shut em, us means and shut em, us wills. Wait, Miss Annie, good Lord, whatever makes it so stare so? Nothing at all, John, our Annie answered. Only the horrible ferocity of that miserable blacksmith. That may neither here nor there, John continued, with some wrath at his own interruption. Blacksmith nor what the squire had been and veered to lose his own custom, as squire took the shooting again, shut any man I would myself as interfered with my trader like it. Look for thee, said Bill Blacksmith, at these best so short and fat, Jan, thee on us wore a goon to shut em, till a z how fat thee was, Jan. Lord, now, Bill, I answer, un what a good cold swat upon me, shut me, Bill, and my own wife and never drum of it. Here John Fry looked round the kitchen, for he had never seen anything of the kind, I doubt, but now made it part of his discourse. From thinking that Mistress Fry was come, as she generally did, to fetch him. What done then, Jan Fry? said the woman who had entered quietly, but was 
only our old Molly. What handsome man as thee has got, Jan, to speak so well of thy, of thy wifey like it? After all the lafe she leads thee. Put thee pot on the fire, old woman, and bow thee on baker, John answered her very sharply. Nobody no right to meddle with a man's bad omen but themselves. Well, here was all these here men awaiting, some with horses, some without, the common folk with long good guns, and the quality with good broad swords. Who were they? Where let me see? There was Squire Mortimer. Here John assumed his full historical key. Him with the pot to his vittle place, and Sir Richard Bellwit shaking over the zaddy, and Squire Sanford the Lee, him with the long nose and one eye, and Sir Gronus Bachchildor over to Nonehead Court, and there were so many more of them tolling up on how they was a going to be promoted for kicking kitchen of Tom Fagus. Hope to God, says I to myself, for Tom wouldn't come here today or up with her, if a doted and who be there to suck a days. Mark me now, all these chops was good to shut em. As her coon crashed the water, the water be weighed now, there and stony, but no deeper than my knee place. D. Canson, good no verter, black men said to me, nobody lower to crass the verd until such time as Fagus coon plays guard us may make sure of em amen zo be it says i god a knoweth i be never in a hurry and would a zooner stop no goon on most tammies with that i pulled my vittles out and zat a horseback a ten of em and on common good they was won't let us have this tamer just saith tim potter as keepeth the bull there and yet i be sorry for him but a man must keep the law her must zo be her can only learn it and now poor tom will swing as high as the top so they get hashes there just the kitchen unvist says i measure rope with the body to measure by hooray here be another now, said Bill Blacksmith, grinning. Another coon help us. What a grave gentleman, a warship of the pace at last. For the gentleman on a cue-bar horse was coming slowly down a hill on to other side of water, looking at us in a friendly way, and with a long papa standing forth the lining of his coat like he. Horse strapped to drink in the water, and gentlemen spat to unkindly, and then they coon right on to unseen, and the gentleman's face was so long and so gray, us veered a warn a goon a preachy us. Courts of King's Bench, saideth one man, checker and plays, saideth another, splish your commission, I doubt, saideth Bill Blacksmith, back by the mayor of Taunton any justice of the king's peace good people to be found near here said a gentleman lifting his hat to us and very gracious in his manner your honor said if bill with his hat off his head there be six or seven warships here all on em very wise em squire martyrer there be the zinner so the gentleman rode up to squire martyrer and raised his cocked hat in a manner that took the squire out of countenance, for he could not do the like of it. Sir, he said, good and worshipful sir, I am here to claim your good advice and valor for purposes of justice. I told his majesty's commission to make a cease a notion rogue whose name is Thomas Fagus. With that he offered his commission, but Squire Martyr told the truth, that he could not read even words and preach, much less written characters. Then the other magistrates rode up and put their heads together, how to meet the London gentlemen without loss of importance. 
there were one of them as could raid purity very and made out king's mark upon it and he bowed upon his horse to the gentleman and he laid his hand on his heart and said worshipful sir we as has the honour of his gracious majest majesty's commission are entirely at your service and crave instructions from you least i seem to underrate the erudition of devonshire magistrates i venture to offer a copy of a letter from a justice of the peace to his bookseller circular eighteen ten a d now in my possession sir please to send me the ass relating to augustus pax ed of l d then a waving of hats began and bowing and making of legs to wan another such as never was seen before but none of them all for air and braden could coom and I, the gentleman with the long gray face your warships have posted the men right well said he with a gather around all around surely that big row will have no chance left among so many valiant musketeers ha what see i there my friend rust in the pan of your gun that gun would never go off sure as i am the king's commissioner and i see another just as bad and lo there's the third pardon me gentlemen i have been so used to his majesty's ordnance yards but i feel that bold rogue would ride through all of you and laugh at your worship's beards by george but what shall us do squire martyr axed i fear there be no oil here discharge your pieces gentlemen and let the men do the same or at least let us try to discharge them and load again with fresh powder it is the fog of the morning half spoiled the primin that rogue is not in sight yet but god knows we must not be asleep with him or what will his majesty say to me if we let him slip once more excellent wondrous well said good sir squire martyrer answered him i never should have thought of that now be a blacksmith tell all the men to be ready to shoot up into the air directly i give the word now are you ready there bill all ready your worship said it bill saluting like a soldier then one two three and shoot cried squire martyrer standing up in the arms of his stirrups thereupon they all blazed out and the noise of it went all around the hills with a girt thick cloud rising and all the air smelling of powder before the cloud was gone so much as ten yards on the wind the gentleman on the cool bald horse shuts up his face like a pair of nut cracks as wide as it was long before and now he pulls two girt pistols alongside a saddle and clappeth one to squire marjorie's head and to other to sir richard's bellwits hand forth your money and all your warrants he said it like a clap of thunder gentlemen have you now the wit to apprehend tom fagus squire marjorie swore so that he ought to be fine but he poured out his purse none the slower for that and so did sir richard bell with first man i see go to load a gun i'll give him the bullet to do it with said toms for you see it was him and no other looking quietly round upon all of them then he robbed all the rest of their warships as pleasant as might be and he saideth now gentlemen do your duty serve your warrants afore you imprison me and with that he made them give up all the warrants and he stuck them in the band of his hats 
and then he made a bow with it. Good morning to your warships now, and a merry Christmas, all of you, and the merrier both for rich and poor, when gentlemen see their arms are given, least you deny yourselves a pleasure, I would aid your warships, and to save you the trouble of following me, when your guns be loaded. This is my strawberry mare, gentlemen, only with a little cream on her. Gentlemen all, in the name of the king, I thank you. All this while he was casting their money among the poor folk by the handful, and then he spanked kindly to the red mare, and wore over the back of the hill in two seconds, and the best part of two miles away. I reckon afore ever a gun were loaded. The truth of this story is well established by first-rate tradition. End of chapter 39 Recording by Daisy 55 Chapter 40 of Lorna Dune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Lorna Dune by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 40. Two Fools Together. That story of John Fry's, instead of causing any amusement, gave us great disquietude, not only because it showed that Tom Fagus could not resist sudden temptation and the delight of wildness, but also that we greatly feared lest the king's pardon might be annulled, and all his kindness cancelled, by reckless deed of that sort. It was true, as Annie insisted continually, even with tears, to wear in her arguments, that Tom had not brought away anything except the warrants, which were of no use at all ex after receipt of the pardon. Neither had he used any violence, except just to frighten people, but could it be established even towards Christmas time that Tom had a right to give alms, right and left, out of other people's money. Dear Annie appeared to believe that it could, saying that if the rich continually choose to forget the poor, a man who forced them to remember, and so to do good to themselves and to others, was a public benefactor, and entitled to every blessing. But I knew, and so Lizzie knew, John Fry, being now out of hearing, that this was not sound argument, for, if it came to that, any man might take the king by the throat, and make him cast away among the poor the money which he wanted sadly for her grace the duchess, and the beautiful countess, of this and of that. Lizzie, of course, knew nothing about his majesty's diversions, which were not fit for a young maid's thought but I now put the form of the argument as it occurred to me. Therefore I said, once for all, and both my sisters always listened when I used the deep voice from a chest, Tom Fagus hath done wrong herein, wrong to himself and to our Annie. All he needed have done was to show his pardon, and the magistrates would have rejoiced with him. He might have led a most godly life, and have been respected by everybody, and knowing how brave Tom is, I thought that he would have done as much. Now, if I were in love with a maid, I put it thus for the sake of poor Lizzie, never would I so imperil my life and her fortune in life along with me, for the sake of a poor diversion. A man's first duty is to the woman, who are forced to hang upon him. Oh, John, not that horrible word, cried Annie, to my great surprise and serious interruption. Oh, John, any word but that. And she burst forth crying terribly. What word, Lizzie? What does the wench mean? 
I asked in the saddest vexation, seeing no good to ask Annie at all, for she carried on most dreadfully. Don't you know, you stupid lout, said Lizzie, contemplating my wonderment by the scorn of her quicker intelligence, if you don't know, ax about. And with that, I was forced to be content, for Lizzie took Annie in such a manner on purpose to vex me as I could see, with her head dropping down, and her hair coming over, and tears and sobs rising and falling to boot, without either order or reason, that seeing no good for a man to do, since neither of them was Lorna. I even went out into the courtyard and smoked the pipe and wonder what on earth is the meaning of woman. Now, in this I was wrong and unreasonable as all women will acknowledge but sometimes a man is so put out by the way they take on about nothing that he really can't help thinking for at least a minute that a woman are a mistake for ever and hence are for ever mistaken nevertheless i could not see that any of these great thoughts and ideas applied at all to my lorna but that she was a different being not woman enough to do anything bad yet enough of a woman for man to adore. And now a thing came to pass which tested my adoration pretty sharply, inasmuch as I would fall life of face, Carver Doone and his father, nay, even the roaring lion himself with his hoofs and flaming nostrils, than have met in cold blood Sir Enzorn Doone, the founder of all the colony, and the fear of the very fiercest. But that I was forced to do at this time, and in the manner following, when I went up one morning to look for my seven rooks' nests, behold, there were but six to be seen, for the topmost of them was all gone, and the most conspicuous. I looked, and looked, and rubbed my eyes, and turned to try them by other sights. And then I looked again. Yes, there could be no doubt about it. The signal was made for me to come, because my love was in danger. For me to enter the valley now, during the broad daylight, could have brought no comfort, but only harm to the maiden and certain death to myself. Yet it was more than I could do to keep altogether at distance. Therefore I ran to the nearest place where I could remain unseen and watch the glen from the wooden height for hours and hours impatiently. However, no impatience of mine made any difference in the scene upon which I was gazing. In the part of the valley which I could see, there was nothing moving except the water and a few stolen cows going sadly along as if knowing that they had no honest right there. It sank very heavily into my heart, with all the beds of dead leaves around it, and there was nothing I cared to do, except blow on my fingers and long for more wit. For a frost was beginning, which made a great difference to Lorna and to myself. I trow, as well as to all the five million people who dwell in this island of England, such a frost as never I saw before. Footnote. If John Reed lived until the year 1740, as so strong a man was bound to do, he must have seen almost a harder frost, and perhaps to put an end to him, and for then he would be some fourscore years old. But tradition makes him keep yet as he says, up to five score years. Neither hope ever to see again a time when it was impossible to milk a cow for icicles, or for a man to shave some of his beard, as I like to do for Lorna's sake, because she was so smooth, without blunting his razor on hard gray ice. No man could keep yet, as we say, even though he abandoned his work altogether and thumped himself all on the chest and the front till his frozen hands would have been bleeding except for the cold that kept still in all his veins. However, 
At present there was no frost, although for a fourth night threatening, and I was too young to know the meaning of the way the dead leaves hung, and the warm cast prickling like woman's combs, and the leading tone upon everything, and the dead weight of the sky. Will Watcombe, the old man in Lynchmouth, who had been half over the world almost, and who talked so much of the Gulf Stream, had, as I afterwards called to mind, foretold a very bitter winter this year. But no one would listen to him because there were not so many hips and haws as usual. Whereas we have all learned from our grandfathers that Providence never sends very hard winters without having furnished a large supply of berries for the birds to feed upon. It was lucky for me, while I waited there, that our very best sheep dog, Old Watch, had chosen to accompany me that day, for otherwise I must have had no dinner, being unpersuaded, even by that, to quit my survey of the valley. However, by aid of poor Watch, I contrived to obtain a supply of food, for I sent him home with a note to Annie fastened upon his chest, and in less than an hour back he came, proud enough to wag his tail off, with his tongue hanging out from the speed of his journey, and a large lump of bread and a bacon fastened in a napkin around his neck. I had not told my sister, of course, what was toward, for my should I make her anxious. When it grew towards dark, I was just beginning to prepare for my circuit around the hills, but suddenly Watch gave a long, low growl. I kept myself close as possible and ordered the dog to be silent, and presently saw a short figure approaching from a thickly wooden hollow on the left side of my hiding place. It was the same figure I had seen once before in the moonlight at Powler's Barrows, and proved to my great delight to be the little maid Gwenny Carfax. She started a moment at seeing me, but more with surprise than fear, and then she laid both her hands upon me, as if she had known me for twenty years. Young man, she said, you must come with me. I was gone all the way to fetch thee. Old man is be dying, and her can't die, or at least her won't, without first considering thee. Considering me, I cried. What can Sir Enzer Doom want with considering me? Has Mistress Lorna told him? All concerning thee and thy thorns. When she knowed old man was so near his end, that vexed he was about thy low's blood, all thought her would come to life again, on purpose for the baby. But after all, there can't be scarcely such bad luck as that. Now, if a strook thee, thou must take it. There be no denying of it, fire I have seen afore, hot and red and raging. But I never seen cold fire afore, and it maketh me burn and shiver. And in truth, it made me burn and shiver, to know that I must either go straight to the presence of Sir Enzo Doom, or give up Lorna once for all, and rightly be despised by her. For the first time of my life, I thought that she had not acted fairly. Why not leave the old man in peace without vexing him about my affair? But presently I saw again that in this manner she was right, that she could not receive the old man's blessing, supposing that he had one to give, which even a worse man might suppose, while she deceived him about herself and the life she had undertaken. Therefore, with great misgivings of myself, but no ill will thought of my darling, I sent watch home and followed Guinea, who led me along very rapidly with her short, broad form gliding down the hollow from which she had first appeared. Here at the bottom, she entered a thicket of gray ash stubs and black holly, with rocks around it gnawed with roots and hung with mask of ivy. Here, in a dark and lonely corner, with a pixie ring before it, she came to a narrow door, 
very brown and solid, looking like a trunk of wood at a little distance. This she opened, without a key, by stooping down and pressing it, where the threshold met the jam, and then she ran in very nimbly, but I was forced to be bent in two, and even so without comfort. The passage was closed, and difficult, and as dark as any black pitch, but it was not long, be it as it might, and in that there was some comfort. We came out soon at the other end, and were at the top of Dune Valley, and the chilly dusk air looked most untempting, especially during that state of mind under which I was laboring. As we crossed towards the captain's house, we met a couple of great dunes lounging by the waterside. Guinea said something to them, and although they stared and stared very hard at me, they let me pass of our hindrance. It is not much to say that when the little maid opened Sir Ensor's door, my heart thumped, quite as much with terror as with hope of Lorna's presence. But in a moment the fear was gone for Lorna was trembling in my arms, and my courage rose to comfort her. The darling feared, beyond all things else, lest I should be offended with her for what she had said to her grandfather, and for dragging me into his presence. But I told her almost a falsehood, the first and the last that ever I did tell her, to wit that I cared not that much, and showed her the tip of my thumb, as I said it, for old Sir Enzer, in all his wrath, so long as I had his granddaughter's love. Now I try to think this as I said it, so as to save it from being a lie, but somehow or another it did not answer, and I was vexed with myself both ways. But Lorna took me by the hand as bravely as she could, and led me into the little passage where I could hear the river moaning and the branches rustling. Here I passed as long a minute as fear ever cheated time of, saying to myself continually that there was nothing to be frightened at, yet growing more and more afraid by reason of so reasoning. At last my Lona came back, very pale, as I saw by the candle she carried, and whispered, now be patient, dearest. Never mind what he says to you. Neither attempt to answer him. Look at him gently and steadfastly. And if you can, with some show of reverence, but above all things, no compassion, it drives him almost mad. Now come, walk very quietly. She led me into a cold, dark room, rough and very gloomy, although with two candles burning. I took little heed of the things in it, though I marked that the window was open. That which I heed was an old man, very stern and calmly, and with death upon his countenance, yet not lying in his bed, but sat upright in a chair, with a loose red cloak thrown over him. Upon this his white hair fell, and his pale fingers lay in a ghastly fashion without a sign of life or movement or of the power that kept him up, all rich, calm, and relentless. Only in his great black eyes, fixed upon me solemnly, all the power of his body dwelt. All the life of his soul was burning. I could not look at him very nicely, being afeard of the death in his face, and most afeard to show it. And to tell the truth, my poor blue eyes fell away from the blackness of his, as if it had been my coffin plate. Therefore I made a low obedience and tried not to shiver. Only I groaned that Lona thought it good manners to leave us two together. Ah, oh, said the old man, and his voice seemed to come from a cave of skeletons. Now you that great John Reed? John Reed is my name, your honor, was all that I could answer. And I hope your worship is better. 
what you have, and you sense enough to know what you have been doing. Yes, I knew right well, I answered, that I have set my eyes far above my rank. Are you ignorant? That Lorna Doon is born of the oldest families remaining in Northern Europe. I was ignorant of that, your worship, yet I knew of her high descent from the dunes of Bagworthy. The old man's eyes, like fire, probed me whether I was jesting. Then perceiving how grave I was, and thinking that I could not laugh, as many people supposed of me, he took upon himself to make the good deficiency with a very bitter smile. And know you of your own low descent from the red to Ori? Sir, I answer, being as yet un unaccustomed to this style of speech, the reds of Ori have been honest men twice as long as the dunes have been rogues. I would not answer for that, John, Sir Enzo replied very quietly, when I expect the fury. If it be so, our family is the very oldest in Europe. Now hearken to me, boy, or clown, or honest fool, or whatever thou art, hearken to an old man's words, who has not many hours to live. There's nothing in this world affair, nothing to reveal trust, nothing even to hope for. Least of all, is there aught to love? I hope your worship is not quite right, I answered with great misgivings. Else it is a sad mistake for anybody to live, sir. Therefore, he continued, as if I had never spoken, though it may seem hard for a week or two, like the loss of any other toy, I deprive you of nothing, but add to your confidence, if there be such a thing to your happiness, when I forbid you ever to see that foolish child again. All marriage is is a wretched farce, even when a man and wife belong to the same rank of life. Uh, have temper well assorted, similar likes and dislikes, and about the same pendants of mind. But when they are not so matched, the farce will become a long, dull tragedy. If anything were worth lamenting, there, I have reason enough for you. I am not in the habit of reasoning, though I have little confidence in man's honor. I have some reliance in woman's pride. You will pledge your word on Lorna's presence never to see or to seek her again. Never even to think of her more. Now call for her. For I am weary. He kept his eye fixed upon me with the icy fire, as if he scorned both life and death, and on his haughty lips some slight amusement at my trouble, and then he raised one hand as if I were a poor dumb creature, and pointed to the door. Although my heart rebelled, and kindled at this proud disdain, I could not disobey him freely. But I made a low salute, and went straight away in search of Lorna. I found my love, or not my love, according as now she should behave, for I was very desperate, being put upon so sadly. Lorna Doom was crying softly at a little window, and listening to the river's grief, I laid my heavy arm around her, not with any air of claiming or of forcing her thoughts to me, but only just to comfort her and ask what she was thinking of. To my arm she made no answer, 
neither to seeking eyes but to my heart once for all she spoke with her upon it not a word no sound between us not even a kiss was interchanged but man or maiden who has ever loved half learning our understanding therefore it came to pass that we saw fit to enter sir Enzo's room in the following manner lorna with her right hand swallowed entirely by the palm of mine and her waist retired from view by means of my left arm all one side of her hair came down in a way to be remembered upon the left and fairest part of my favorite outer skin waistcoat and her head as well would have lain there doubtless but for the danger of walking so i for my part was too far gone to lag behind in the matter but carried my love bravely fearing neither death nor hell while she abode beside me old sir Enzer looked much astonished for forty years he had been obeyed and feared by all around him and he knew that i had feared him vastly before i got hold of lorna and indeed i was still afraid of him only for loving lorna so and having to protect her then i made him a bow to the very best of all i had learned both at tiverton and in london after that i waited for him to begin as became his age and rank ye two fools he said at last with a deep of contempt which no words may express ye two fools may i please your worship i answered softly maybe we are not such fools as we look but though we be we are well content so long as we be two fools together why john said the old man with a spark as of smiling in his eyes thou art not altogether the clumsiest yoke and the clod i took thee for oh no grandfather oh dear grandfather cried lorna with such zeal and flashing that her hands went forward nobody knows what john ridge is because he is so modest i mean nobody except me dear and here she turned to me again and rose upon tiptoe and kissed me i have seen a little of the world said the old man while i was half ashamed although so proud of lorna but this is beyond all i have seen and nearly all i have heard of it is more fit for southern climates than for the fogs of exmoor it is fit for all the world your worship with your honour's good leave and will i answered in humbly being still ashamed of it when it happens so to people there is nothing that can stop it sir now sir Enzo doone was leaning back upon his brown chair rail which was built like a triangle as in old farmhouses from one of which it had come no doubt free from expense of gratitude and as i spoke he coughed a little and he sighed a good deal more and perhaps his dying heart desired to open time again with such a lift of warmth and hope as he described in our eyes and arms i could not understand him then any more than a baby playing with his grandfather's spectacles nevertheless i wonder whether at his time of life or rather on the blink of death he was thinking of his youth and pride fools you are fools you are be fools for ever said sir Enzo doom at last while we feared to break his thoughts but let each other know our own with little ways of pleasure 
it is the best thing I can wish you. Boy and girl, be boy and girl, until you have grandchildren. Partly in bitterness, he spoke, and partly in pure weariness. And then he turned so as not to see us, and his white hair fell like a shroud around him. End of chapter 40 Recording by Daisy 55